Welcome back to video 38, New Testament in Context. You're uh, watching Rev9 video, the channel on YouTube. We kind of left off uh, at the end of 1 John. Uh, didn't cover the uh, quotes. So if we're looking at 1 John 2.18, that line, I uh, pointed out that uh, cross-references to Matthew 12.35. So if we go to Matthew, it kind of starts in the, kind of starts back with the idea in 30, it's talking about blasphemy of the spirit will never be forgiven, which is the reason that the, uh, he said the terrors would be burnt in the fire, he wouldn't forgive them for, uh, cursing the spirit of Christ and the spirit was you know the ability to heal people and the ability to raise people from the dead and that kind of thing so that's what they were saying they didn't want uh, you could say something about Christ but you couldn't curse the spirit or the idea that uh, he can give people everlasting life and so forth so in 34 it says you venomous breed how can you preach purity when you are yourselves depraved for the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart the beneficent man draws from his treasury of purity goodness and the depraved man can only produce depravity from his stores of depravity I tell you however that every vile idea that men give expression to they shall render a reason for it in the day of judgment so on Judgment Day is where it's all decided. So until you get to that point, then apparently nothing's decided. For by your thoughts you will be acquitted, and by your thoughts you will be convicted. And then he's talking to the professors and Pharisees in the next verse, where they say, well, we wish to see a sign from you, but in reply, he says, then there's a depraved and botched race, ask for a divine sign. Actually, it was logical to ask for a sign. If you think about it, if you understand that uh, the coming of Christ, uh, there's all these prophecies back in uh, the prophets about Christ. So, uh, yes, they were wanting this sign. Uh, what they didn't understand was is that most of these prophecies are not about the first coming of Christ, they're about the second coming of Christ. They had no idea uh, that he was going to uh, die and then return and all that kind of thing. So what the prophecies they wanted to see the sign of were uh, the prophecies of the second coming. They just didn't realize that that's what it was. Uh, but yeah, I would probably ask for the sign of uh, him bringing all 12 tribes back together uh, in uh, rebuilding New Jerusalem and uh, destroying the enemies of the Israel people. I mean, that was the signs. That's all through your prophecy. That's what he's going to do. In fact, we're going to see a little bit of that here in just a second. But yeah, uh, this, uh, it really was logical to ask for a sign. But the point is, is uh, even if he had given them one, it didn't matter because they uh, rejected him. They rejected the spirit, the ability of him to heal, to uh, restore people to life you know, heal them outright and all that kind of thing. That's the spirit that they were really uh, rejecting, so. All right, so that was that quote. Uh, and then the children of Yahweh versus the children of the devil. And everybody knows Genesis 3.15, and, and he does say he'll destroy that enmity, which is where we get that from Genesis 3.15. And then the spirit of truth versus the spirit of error, 4.2 through 6 in First John. That went to Isaiah 32, 6 through 8. I say it's the rebellious children from 31 through 17. And then uh, I mistakenly mentioned 510. Five, the next verse there, 510, is actually 1 John 5, 10, 12, and 19. Those who trust in the devil represent Christ as a liar. So that was uh, not Isaiah, as I mentioned. The quote to Isaiah is Isaiah 32. All right, so let's go back to Isaiah 32. All right, I'll say six through eight. I probably should uh, grab my King James. Yeah, let's just see what it says, King James. 
The interesting thing about 32 is there's a number of quotes. We're going to see this in a second. Coming back to this section. There's probably five direct quotes back here into Isaiah talking about these uh, Jews against Christ. And so it's kind of important that we get the gist of this. I say, uh, what did I say, 32, 6 through 8? Yeah, I have five. Let's start with five. <clears throat> the vile person shall no more be called liberal, nor the churl say to the bountiful, for the vile person will speak villainy, and his heart will work iniquity to practice hypocrisy and to utter error against the Lord, so the spirit of error, to make empty the soul of the hungry, and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. The instruments also of the churl, C-H-U-R-L, should have looked that word up, are evil. He devises wicked devices to destroy the poor with lying words, even when the needy speaketh right. But the liberal devises liberal things, and by liberal things shall he stand. Jeez, I think mine was better than that. All right, let's read it in the Ferrari. Then the brute shall no, be called, no more be called noble. In other words, they were the nobles. They were the leadership, and they were the uh, head of the synagogue and the head of the government in that sense. Nobles, chief priests, Pharisees, blah, 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 and lawyers, elders, that kind of thing. So, the brute shall no, be called, no more be called noble, and the rascal no longer named honest. So, uh, in other words, thinking that their leadership were honest, yeah. For the brute is a brute in his language and heart, does low and vile acts, and disputes with the Lord. Leads the faint souls astray, speaking of the people that they're ruling over, which is the general public. Turns the thirsty from water. Plans to tangle the poor, uses the schemes of the bad by false speeches and lying, defrauding of justice. So the justice system with, that does not uh, administer justice is one of the biggest uh, crimes that the, uh, God uh, mentions in prophecy. But the noble plans nobly and on his virtue will rise. So yes, the person who, who is righteous, in other words, Will be rewarded for that. Now, the interesting thing about that is that that actually, uh, these people who it's talking about, the context of that, did I mention that? Uh, okay, I said it comes from 31 through 7. Yeah, so the context actually comes from the first verse of Isaiah. Because this, I mentioned before, we were already up there in those first few verses where I showed you to separate the ones against Christ uh, versus the ones for Christ and all that. Well, this you can go backwards. You want to know uh, who these people are, you just back up and then find uh, where it mentions them before and so on and so forth. Well, if you go back to 29... The interesting thing is uh, 29, uh, really 29, 10, I think, 10 through 14, I believe, are the verses that are quoted. Look back here, yeah. 10 through 14 are quoted at least five times from the New Testament. And they're cross-referenced in another probably 20 times, that little section there. So that's all quotes about Jews against Christ, in other words. So, if you back up from where we are here, you find the same thing. You roll back to see the context, try to figure out who it's talking about. Well, here uh, in 30 and 27, it talks about the power of the Lord coming, hot uh, rage and wrath, tongue like devouring fire, and so on and so forth, to scatter the heathen. And a bridle were put in the jaw of the pagan. And his arm will seem to strike down a fierce rage. It's 30-30. Bright flame with devouring fire, floods, hailstones, and storm. Yes, um, and I mentioned that that actually uh, seems to cross-reference to it, or is cross-reference to it, Ezekiel 38-17, as Gog and Magog. The Lord's uh, voice shall strike Asher as though with a staff. 
and wherever that is punishing, uh, that punishing rod is applied, which the Lord lays upon him with strokes, so think govern with an iron rod, okay? It will fight with the clashing of warrior bands, in other words, armies, for the old spreading slough for its king was prepared with a, a broad wild pile of fire and plenty of wood as a river of sulfur, the Lord's breath in flame. So it's talking about destroying people in war. Same thing at 31, the Lord lifts his hand, it's verse 3. Together the whole are destroyed. Talks about fighting people against the troop of my shepherds. So people coming against Israel, right? And then it says, turn Israel back to the one you offended. So it's talking about the uh, base of the house of God turning back. <clears throat> each with his idols of silver and idols of gold, which your own hands have made. So, it's actually talking about people of uh, the 12 tribes. Verse 9, says the Lord who has brightness in Zion, Jerusalem, splendor. Yeah, the context, if you just look at it, uh, just kind of go backwards and forwards, like I said, that's where you can put stuff in context. Well, Context kind of starts in 30, if you're, if you're looking, woe, you sons of revolt, which was the idea of the Jews against Christ, who make plans not for me, and cast idols, but not by my will, and heap sin upon sin. There he's talking about who traveled to go down to Egypt. So that's kind of mentioned in Jeremiah as well. In other words, the uh, people didn't want to go into captivity in Babylon, in other words, and he talks about the snake in verse 6, race of no use. He's going to Egypt for help. Go carve a tablet for the time of the future to last for all ages that this race are sons of revolt, lying children, disciplined to obey the Lord's laws. So, if they're disciplined to obey the Lord's laws, as it says in verse 9, that means they're part of Israel but they revolt. So again, just keep going backwards. Who are the ones who revolt? Well, that started, you know, out in the very first Isaiah. It separates the ones who revolt, Jews against Christ, versus the Jews uh, for Christ. So the whole context stays the same. And again, the ones who revolt are all here in 30. If you just go through that, you can see. And if you look back from there, it's the same thing. You just keep going back. This quote here in 20, like I said, in 29, 10 through 14 is quoted many times in the New Testament. You'll recognize that if you got a cross-reference Bible. Just look up how many times that's mentioned. And then if you back up to 28, you, you see the stone, which is Christ the stone, which is cross-referenced and quoted. Uh, a whole bunch of times in the New Testament, that's 2816. And then you back up, you see scornful jesters in 14 who rule in Jerusalem over this race, who say, we recorded a treaty with death. Yes, that was the, that was the leadership, the Pharisees, the chief priests and all that, who when they uh, wanted to get, trying to get Christ uh, crucified, in other words, in front of Pilate, they said, no, let his blood be on us and our children. That's the ones who recorded a treaty with death, see? And then there's Christ, and then he says uh, in 17, 18, right down there, your treaty with death, your league with the pit will not stand, so on and so forth. So and he talks about his uh, judgment day, I guess, at the end of 22 there, and so on. So if you just keep going back, go forward, and so forth, and if you go to 27, the first verse, and the day the Lord comes with his great and sharp sword conquers the snake. So that's judgment day when everything's done. Yeah. And he talks about uh, gleaning up Israel's sons one by one from among them. That's in 20, that's 27, 12. Okay. Bringing people back from captivity. Of course, he's talking about people from uh, Israel people, and Ephraim, beautiful crown to his people remaining, that's 28 to 5. 
Spirit of justice to those who trust justice. All right. And ruler to those who drive war from the gate. In other words, no more war. All right. So, if you just keep going backwards and forwards, you can see. And before that, we've got Judgment Day mentioned multiple times and so on. So, <clears throat> just got to look at the highlights, put things in the context. So, even though that started from 32, it really was focused on this section here in 29, uh, 10 through 14, which is quoted multiple times in scriptures. In fact, right here on the chart, uh, as we'll see if we get over to that. Uh, I think there's two more quotes or three more quotes from Matthew, Mark, uh, to this verse. Yeah, well, at least at least three, just so I'm glancing up there. Uh, there's at least three quotes just in Matthew and Mark there. So, yeah, a lot of quotes in Romans, 1 Corinthians, and all that. So, <clears throat> this is the, one of the main sections right here in Isaiah. So, this connects to the New Testament over and over. The point is, about who these people are who are against them. You come over here and look in Isaiah, and it's clearly people of the 12 tribes, but like I pointed out, it's people who had their names taken out of the book of life, and then uh, he said also his their posterity would be uh, uh, taken out of the book of life. So them and their children, that's what it said. That, so that was original prophecies that we started with at the beginning of this in chapter uh, 23 of Matthew. So follows the same context all the way through so and then at the end of John there I said uh, the point was is the Jews against Christ or the synagogue of Satan in Revelation either way you want to look at it the only option was to kill the heir in other words Christ was the heir and seize the vineyard by force to remain in authority till the owner comes till the owner returns so that was the parable of the vineyard I said well look we'll go up and uh, kill the heir and then we'll take control of the vineyard and the vineyard was the kingdom of God the 12 tribes who were relying on them to teach them properly and all this kind of thing but in fact they were using their knowledge of scripture and prophecy to rule over their uh, brethren you know their kindred people and so they made money and had large uh, mansions and land and everything so they loved all the luxuries and so, but they had to uh, lie to the general public. And we see the same thing today. That people run your government, just rule over you, and they're supposed to follow the Constitution, but, you know, it's just a piece of paper. So, as George Bush put it, at any rate, same concept here in a sense, except this was a prophecy. And uh, so they had a legitimate reason to ask for a sign and sense, but uh, they didn't have the Spirit of God, didn't desire it anyway, which was Christ's point. Why, why give it to you? You, don't, you have no desire for it uh, regardless. And so he picked out people who did have some desire for it and were looking for him to come and fulfill the prophecy. It just was uh, not, they were not able to tell Not able to tell, first coming versus second. So anyway, let's go back to uh, Matthew then. Start with Matthew 2.16. Now, the, I realize, you know, we're, we're in Matthew 23. So what I'm doing is I'm going back through all of the cross-references to the Jews against Christ because that Matthew 23 is where... Uh, you know, Christ is speaking to, to them, in other words, and uh, tells them they're children of those who killed the prophets, and so on and so forth. And talking about those that hate him, those that are blotted from the book of lives, and all that kind of thing. So he gets into all these, uh, pointing out who they are. I'm pointing out there have to be 12 tribes. And one of the reasons for that is not everybody really understands that thought. Uh, some of them would assume, uh, it's easy to assume, well, these could be... Uh, Oh, some people think they're Edomite priests, for example, because there were Edomite priests, the Herodians, they were actually in control over the priest of the 12 tribes in the house of Judah or, you know, house of, Ju uh, house of Judah specifically, you know, you know, either 
or tribe of Judah, either one you want to look at, you can see the distinctions. The point is, uh, I'm going through all these uh, cross references uh, all the way through the basically the New Testament so we can see who these people were. I don't think any pastor's ever done this. It's kind of complicated. It takes a long time. A lot of quotes. But then you get rid of all this controversy over, okay, well, you know, are these people some uh, seed line of Edom? Or are they some seed, well, which is a, a popular way of looking at it. And I say, no, can't be. If you look at what Christ teaches himself, it clearly tells you in these quotes that they're people of, you know, people of the 12 tribes, that they just rejected Christ and rejected the Spirit. They were in the desert. They saw, uh, you know, all these things that Christ did for them, and they rejected that because they were uh, wanting the money and, the, uh, you know, everything that comes along with that. So, Anyway, let's go to Matthew 2.16, and the point of this is that there's three prophecies right here at the beginning. Edomite, King Herod, so King Herod and his son, so this was Herod 1, fails to kill Christ as a child, which fulfills three prophecies. So right off the bat, in Matthew, we've got the, the king, and uh, you know, people mention Herod, they don't necessarily mention he's an Edomite, so he's in control. And then, oh, oh well, okay, so, and the vision to fly to Egypt with Christ. Okay, so we'll see that as we look down. So, the first uh, quote mentioned here is Micah 5.2, which is uh, in 2.6. Uh, so, the priest, so Herod heard about this Jesus, in other words, and then the uh, so he brought the chief priests and professors, asked them where, where this Messiah would be born, which was supposed to be a king, right, over Israel, because he was the king in his eyes. So they said in Bethlehem, for it was recorded in the prophet, talking about Micah 5.2. So the priests and the professors and the leaders of Israel in the synagogue knew about this Messiah. Right off the bat, they quote a pro prophecy in, in Micah about uh, where he's going to be born. So they knew about it. They were expecting him. They just didn't know, obviously, exactly when he was going to come. At any rate, so Herod, we all know the story of the Magi and all that. So they left. It says a messenger appeared to Joseph. That's verse uh, 13. Told him to fly to Egypt. And then that became a prophecy so it says the prophet might be fulfilled that's Hosea 11 1 I called my son out of Egypt so the fact that uh, they he went to Egypt and then returned fulfilled a prophecy about Christ the fact that Herod killed these children of Israelite children fulfilled a prophecy about Christ which is an interesting one uh, and that's in uh, verse 18 and then where Christ was to be uh, come from in Micah, to come from Bethlehem, was a prophecy that they were expecting as well. So, there was multiple prophecies about where Christ was to come from, because he was to come from Bethlehem, but then how could he come from Egypt and Bethlehem? Well, here's the events that follow all those prophecies about Christ and explain how he could be coming from three different places. <laughs> in other words, as we'll see, multiple places, prophecies, so how does that uh, figure? Well, the way it figures is the way, exactly the way it plays out. So sometimes that's why prophecies and things are confusing. One seems to, because, you know, if you were just thinking about it, well, wouldn't Micah 5.2 uh, conflict with Hosea 11.1 1, and uh, wouldn't that conflict with others and so forth? Yeah, when you got multiple prophecies like that, it's hard to distinguish how those all connect. But as we read the story, we see, well, well they're all true. And But if you're uh, looking at prophecies, sometimes they seem to conflict with each other. And the reason is because you don't see how all the events are, that are surrounding the prophecies. So, yes, it is hard to uh, look at stuff and figure this out. At any rate, we get down to... Uh, 
The third one, uh, Jeremiah 31, 15 to 20. This is the one about the uh, children being killed. And then Herod died, it says, right after that. So when you go to Jeremiah 31, let's go over there and have a look at that, because that's a, kind of an interesting thing. 31.15 So, right here in the middle of other prophecy that we have in Jeremiah, he puts this in about the, it's called the weeping in uh, Rama, Rama. Hmm. A voice is heard, and we all know that, about her children being uh, killed. So he went and killed all these uh, children uh, two years and younger. But if you back up to 30, it says a uh, message came to Jeremiah from the ever-living. Write and hold this message, which I've told you in a book. For see, the days come when I will restore the captives of my people, so they're in captivity, of Israel and Judah. Okay. And return them to the land that I gave their ancestors, and they shall possess it. Okay. So that is one of the signs that the uh, priest would be looking for because they knew these prophecies in Jeremiah. So they were just at most the house of Judah living there at that time. So when was he going to restore all 12 tribes to Jerusalem? And there's more, but you know, that's just a start right there. When was he going to do that? Well, they didn't see that. They didn't see him doing that. So they were expecting uh, some, a warrior to come in a sense, right? And then he talks about, and then how you figure out that he's in distress. In that day, I'll break the yoke off your neck, snap the shackles. They will no longer serve the foreigners. That's verse 8. So here again, they're looking to be uh, the Romans, to be uh, t taken away from their yoke. And uh, Christ didn't do that. So they're thinking that applies to them at that period of time. So they don't know the time frame. They don't know this is a return of Christ, second return of Christ, right? Or I should just say the return of Christ. Either way, second coming. They didn't know that. So, Jacob, my servant, fear not, and Israel be not depressed, for I will rescue you from afar, and your race from the land of slavery, when Jacob shall rest in quiet and without terror. That's verse 10. For I'll be with you, save you, and make an end of all nations where I scattered you. But I will not make an end of you, but correct you with justice, and when corrected, I will not punish further. That's uh, Jeremiah 30, verse 11. So, they were expecting that sign. To see all 12 tribes being brought back, to be punished with justice, and then not punished further. But Christ to make an end of all these nations where they were scattered. There's another sign they were looking for. You see? I will grant your restoration, that's verse 17. I will restore Jacob's captured halls, extend his dwellings, build his city on high, and found his palace on justice, that's verse 18. And his children shall be as old with a parliament before me, firm and fixed. His leaders shall be from himself, his governors from his own breast, verse 21. And then in chapter 31, you will understand it in the future times at the period. Of course, this is in Jeremiah, so they didn't know when the future times were. For as far as they were concerned, they were in the future. When I'll be a God to all the families of Israel, and they will be my people. So there you go. Starts right out in 31. The nation of Israel remaining from the sword has found favor in the desert where it went to rest itself. Okay, well, wait a minute. The desert where it went to rest itself. Isn't that from Revelation chapter 12 when the... Uh, you know, crown of 12 stars and the woman, Sarah. So it's the, it's the tribe, 12 tribes going into the desert. It's exactly the same concept what it tells you in Revelation chapter 12. Yeah. And then the ever living, verse 3, saw me from afar and love. I love you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I will track you by kindness. I will build you again and you shall be rebuilt. Virgin of Israel. All right. Well, doesn't that... Isn't that what it says in Revelation 
Chapter 14. <clears throat> Plant vineyards on the hills. Da -da -da, shout Jacob. Oh, ever living Savior people, the fragments of Israel. That's verse 7. And isn't that what they are? A remnant or fragments? Yes. Okay. I'll bring from them from the land of the north, collect them from the flanks of the world. In other words, all four corners of the earth. With their blind, lame, pregnant, childing woman shall return together in a great crowd. They went away in tears, but on paths of delight, I will lead them in jubilee to rivers of water by a level way in which they cannot stumble. If I'll be a father to Israel with Ephraim as my firstborn. Hear the message, Lord, report it to the distant isles where the twelve tribes are, and isles, I think England, Ireland, and so on. Proclaim to the race of Israel, all twelve tribes, he who scattered us will guard us as a shepherd does his flock. So, scattered, think all twelve tribes were scattered. There were uh, some in Jerusalem at that time. There were still, the Magi actually came from the east, and so there were in Babylon, the house of Judah. So they came from that area and came across to Israel, to Jerusalem. So that's where the Magi came from. They were Israelites. Otherwise they wouldn't have known when Christ was going to be born, wouldn't know anything about the signs in the skies. For they were living will redeem Jacob and free him from the hand that is stronger than his. So, so they're looking for a king to destroy the people who are ruling over them. That's what the, the Pharisees and so forth were looking for. And you can just read through that. But I say that goes for 30 uh, through 33. And yeah, you turn over to 31 and scroll down. Uh, 31, 23, when I restore you from captivity, he's talking to Judah, the ever-living bless you, home of righteousness. Remember the king of righteousness, Melchizedek, hill of holiness, that's New Jerusalem, for Judah shall reside in it. All the cities together with farmers, shepherds of the flocks, when I refresh the weary life and fill every exhausted soul. 27. Proceed, the day is come when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man, the seed of cattle. So, in other words, he's going to restore all them plus their animals and vineyards and food and all that kind of thing and their cities. And as I watch them to pull up and drive out and break down and to ruin and to punish, I will come that in the same way I'll watch over them to build and plant. In those times, that's verse 29, they shall not say again, the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. For a man shall only die for his own faults. Everyone who eats sour grapes, his own teeth shall be set on edge. And you can see that. It's talking about false prophets and stuff. Okay, verse 31. The times will come when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Isn't it? This is not that not Hebrews 8.8. 8. Okay. All 12 tribes. Right there from Hebrews 8.8. 8. Unlike the covenant I made with their fathers when I brought them out of Egypt, all right, which covenant they broke, although I was their guardian, thank Christ the shield, Christ the rock, but this is the covenant I'll make with the house of Israel after these days. And of course, he already told you it was both houses, right? I'll fix my laws in their heart, write them upon their breast. All right, so the backwards. I will be their God, they shall be my people. There you go, Hebrews 8.8, 8, again. 12 tribes, all 12 tribes brought out of captivity where they were punished. This is what the uh, Pharisees and priests wanted to see him do. They just didn't realize that this was the second coming of Christ when all this was going to be do done. They thought he was going to do it when he came the first time. That was their big question, even though they didn't really have a heart for any of it. And that's what he said, you don't deserve it, so... Because you you're going to kill me, and here, I, here I've, helped, I've done nothing but help you since I've been here, and the first thing you want to do is kill me because, uh, you know, he, I'm healing people on the wrong day, right? For all of them will know me from the least to the greatest, for I will pardon their frailty and no more remember their sins. That's the end of 34. Sure, the time's come. This is 38. 
when the city will be built for the ever living. Okay, so this is New Jerusalem. Not be confused with the Jerusalem over there in the Middle East. It's not going to be over there. Shall never be pulled up or thrown down forever. That's uh, verse 40. And then I said it would go all the way to 32, and it does. You just look through 32, you see, uh, oh, here's a good one, 32, 27. None of my promises will fail. So all his promises being 12 tribes back together in New Jerusalem, he never transferred that. He never said, well, oh, when we get to uh, when I, he comes, in other words, in the New Testament, He's going to transfer all these promises over to some new people called Gentiles. No, he said right there. He said multiple times in the Old Testament that none of his words would fail. It would all come true just exactly as he told you about it. So, exactly as Prof said. So, if you go over to 3230, children of Israel, children of Jew have done wrong in my sight. So he sweeped them from his presence on account of the wickedness which the children of Israel, children of Judah. So, accusing all twelve tribes, they're kings, nobles, priests, and preachers. That's in 32-32. So there you go. There's the ones he's complaining against, the people who were running the show. They're the ones that are really uh, the more problematic because if your preachers don't tell you what's uh, correct and they lie to you, then people tend to want to just believe whatever they say. Even if they think, well, maybe they're not teaching correctly, they just don't know because they don't have that education always to uh, understand Scripture. <sighs> Set up idols, erected columns to Baal. Pass their sons and daughters to Moloch. So that's why they were taken out of the book of life. That's 35. But I'll collect them again from the countries where I've driven them in my anger and indignation. That's verse 37. I'll restore them in a great gathering to this place. There you go. That's what they were expecting to see. Where they can dwell in security. They'll become my people. I'll be their God. Also give them a unified heart, a unified course. They will reverence me continually to their own benefit and their children, in other words, their posterity after them. I'll then record an everlasting covenant with them. Exactly what we just said in the last chapter. That will not cease following them with benefits. So put reverence in me in their hearts so they will never abandon me. So, I'll restore the captivity. That's 32-44. So, they're judged at the end time. Remnant saved, brought back from captivity. We've seen all these things here, pieces of it. Same thing in 33. It says he's hidden himself in verse 5, turning away from the city because of all their wickedness. I will again bring existence and health and unveil to them rich peace and security when I have restored the captives of Judah and the captives of Israel. So he's telling you there's going to be captives of all 12 tribes, with their children, and he's going to restore them to their former state. I'll purify them from their frailties by which they offended me, pardon the whole of their sins by which they offended me, by which they rebelled. It should be a monument of delight and beauty, speaking about New Jerusalem. All right, so I'm going through this because and here again, 3311, uh, for I'll restore the captives to the country, to their former state. Same thing he said. Get down to 3314. Be assured the day come, days come, when I will accomplish this good promise, which I promised to the house of Judah, house of Israel, and house of Judah, all 12 tribes in those days, and at that period, I will cause the perfect scepter to rise up. He will execute justice and right in the land. In those times, Judah will be saved, Israel will rest secure, and this is what she will call him, our righteous Lord, Melchizedek, right? King of righteousness. For thus says the ever-living, there shall not be wanting a man to David to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. To the Levitical priests, there shall not be wanting a man before me to offer up burnt offerings, incense, and gifts, and to make sacrifice for all time. All right. 
And if you just continue on, on 33, it talks about the race of David a few times. And then in 20, 30, so this is chapter 33, verse 24. Have you seen what this people say? The two families that the ever-living chose, he has cast off and rejected the nations from continuing in his presence. Think two witnesses, two families. Two families of witnessing people and that's the prophecy of, uh, I was trying to think of the verse, I guess it's 37, 9. It's the prophecy of Joseph to uh, Jacob. Talking about, uh, which was passed on to Ephraim and Manasseh. So Ephraim and Manasseh was these families that were in control over this great nation and this commonwealth of nations. That's the, that's the, context of the two witnesses. Every living, however, declares, if I have not appointed the institutions of day and night, fixed the laws of solar systems and the earth, so he fixed all the laws of everything we know of, then I will repudiate the race of Jacob and my minister David, and not take from his race governors for the race of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, when I restore their captives and pity them. So it's kind of a, uh, what do you say, that's a, a negative, uh, there's a name for that. Anyway, again, points out, it's Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their posterity that he's dealing with. No one else. So, at any rate. And then it's the uh, same things but back in chapter 23, I think. So... He never says the things he's talking to or and his prophecies are not going to come true. He says just the opposite. So, <clears throat> I want to go over that since that link back here. And I say, uh, the house of Judah, the house of Israel is mentioned nine times. Yeah, we, we saw it a few times. <laughs> And judgment on Ephraim explains why it's missing in Revelation chapter 7. Since he's the one that hosts Babylon the Great in the great city Babylon, which is destroyed in Revelation 16, 19, 17, 18, and 18, 8 through 10. So yes, uh, Ephraim, uh, his whole nation is the one that's destroyed and broken into three pieces and all that kind of thing, which is the reason it leaves his name out, but they'll still be... Uh, Obviously, people from Ephraim, it's just the nation that he was given uh, is going to be destroyed. And I think Dan as well, uh, the whole nation of Dan uh, may be destroyed when you have the meteorite. I guess that's the uh, second trump, trumpet. And it appears that uh, it's going to uh, doing a lot of ships and all that kind of thing. Well, I think it's, you know, it's a meteorite or comet, whatever. We'll, like I say, you'll see all the stuff after the fact. It's not that, it'll be something else, but it'll look the same. The end result will look the same, so it really doesn't matter what's a meteorite or it's something else. Whatever it is, it will hit, it'll, everything will happen, all prophecy will be realized after the fact. So, you know, just trying to show that the context of this stuff, can, the dots can be connected. We've got... Uh, uh, everything in the New Testament goes right back here to the Old Testament. The dots connect. All these prophecies in the Old Testament are going to happen exactly. There was no change in the New Testament, which all these pastors, if they just read the quotes, looked up all these quotes, they would realize that none of this is changing. There's nothing changing. It's all quoted. Just go back there and look at it. Put it in the context by looking before and, and after put things in context and, the, and I've got it here on the chart for you. So most of whatever you would need, I've already put up here on the chart so people can learn it if they're interested. So we'll come back with uh, video 39. We'll pick up at the top of the chart up there on Matthew 3, 7 through 10. So thanks for watching.